<clears throat> okay. This is the uh, third time I'm recording this. Hey everybody, this series is for me as a beginner dungeon master to talk about my off-camera game, some homebrew ideas, for me to feel ready to DM on this channel. Hey, so this video, like all videos on this channel, are brought to you by wonderful, awesome backers of Fables, both patreon.com slash fablesd20 and the membership here on YouTube. Let me tell you something before we get on with this video, let me tell you something very important, very special, very unique about the backers and what I've been able to do with their donations. All that money goes directly back to this channel, whether it's equipment, whether it's minis, whether it's... It's kind of those things, equipments and minis. Over the last year and a half, a lot of both Patreon money and my own money have gone to investing in equipment. From monitors to cameras to monopods to better microphones, lighting, more lighting to come, lenses. So much. It takes so much to film tabletop content. It is incredible. And now that we're hitting near the end of investing in a bunch of equipment, we're entering the territory where we're going to be investing in more minis, goblins. Orcs, skeletons, the basic default go-to sets. And from there, we'll branch off into more specific niche groups that are that are coming up in those campaigns. So in Fables of Refuge, for example, Jared has very specific minis that he prefers to use for encounters, right? Such as cultists and demons, elementals, and we don't have those minis just laying around. We have to go out and buy them one at a time when they come up for the adventure. It'd be nice to invest in groups and chunks. Like here's a dozen goblins, here's a dozen orcs, here's a dozen cultists, each one a little bit different, not a lot, so it's not crazy, but enough to communicate story through the mini. And that's what the next phase of the Patreon and the backing of fables is going to go to is those minis like i said i'm wrapping up buying the final pieces of equipment a couple more lights mics and lenses <laughs> just to fine tune everything and make everything just right because we film in this very specifically small space all right let's begin the last time i talked about my sessions session six is where my characters got into the manor and there was some fudgery with me and the module. I think I was relying too much on the module and not understanding where to give and take. It's what the players kind of want because I kind of started without a session zero, my fault. So I'm gonna talk about session seven, eight, nine, 10 and 11. Kind of sum them up, get you all caught up to what's happening right now off camera. It's been a while. Let's just plow through it. Major talking points. Got it? Cool. I have maps I can show you too. So my players started in this room and they went into the darkness and they came into this massive cavern. In this cavern, uh, is this upside down? They came in from down below. They had the ability to cross two bridges. Uh, they decided to go down the bottom bridge where there was a trap. The trap was if you're over five pounds, you break the rope, trigger the trap, r bridge breaks. I loved the unapologeticness of this trap. Uh, but in the moment, I felt a little empathy for my players and we kind of just turned it into a skill challenge, which was fun in its own way. I, I feel like I need to get a, figure out my familiarity with traps. I like the idea of them being brute full and unapologetic, but I also like the idea that there's a skill challenge or abilities to get around them. And this is the, kind of those first steps of me as a beginner DM realizing that and learning that. On the other side of the bridge, there was a Nothic, a one-eyed xenomorph alien looking dude. They had a riddle, poetic, like lore, hints and clues to what's going on in the module, what happens on the other side of the module kind of stuff. It felt very Gollum and Bilbo, which a few of my friends really appreciated and liked. After the riddle stuff, I just wanted to get through this basement. I came up with a magical puzzle of every time you go south, you go north, right? And so every time they went through a south door, they ended up going north on the map and they found their way to Glassstaff, the kind of like boss of this area's lab. She wasn't there. They found their way to a tunnel that's not in the module. This is me 
getting myself out of this basement. In that tunnel, they fought spiders, giant spiders, swarms of spiders. Uh, they fought glass staff. This is also not a not the best role play scenario with NPCs I had as a enemy. I definitely feel like I should write more what they would say versus like uh, it depends on what the players say because I, I definitely stumbled a lot there. After they killed Glassstaff, the spiders took the body and the head away because she got decapitated by my fighter, who's a drow. Glassstaff was also a drow in my version, tying it to the major plot point of the module. And then they got surrounded by spiders, swarms of spiders, giant spiders, even more, and swarms of ravens come through the tunnel to save them, attacking all the spiders and making a way for them to run down the tunnel and get to the other side. They come through a door that's built into a tree and they fall out of the tree. It's no longer winter, it's summer and it's the middle of the night. That was the end of session seven. Session eight is a travel session. I know I have the video about my travel turns. Session eight was the catalyst of making that system. I sucked at traveling and I wanted a system that I liked, that made sense to me, that I could apply to my players because as we did the traveling, it was long and boring and I didn't want to just jump to the other end, but I also wanted to show my players that, hey, we're in the woods in a fantasy world. There are stuff happening at night. There are things happening during the day. You're in the woods, it's dangerous. But the problem is though they were rolling on random encounter tables that I designed for my terrain, I didn't get the, they didn't get in a fight. They were just witnesses to nature and that I learned is not if they're walking and there's a monster to witness the implication is the dungeon master put a monster in front of me to fight work on that use my travel turn system that I've made and I will keep experimenting to get better at traveling we get to a ruined not ruined ruined watchtower they climb to the top they see where they are they realize oh there's the town that we were there's the, t the city that we started this entire adventure in, and there is a ruined, again, ruined ancient town with a, with a little tower in it, another tower. Uh, they're like, okay, we can spend the night over there. They climb down, they head over, and they've entered Thunder Tree, a town in the module. There they meet a druid, Redith. In the module, it's just an old man. I made an old woman turtle. They go into her house, which I have as protected with a variant of the tiny hut spell. They learn some lore about the dragon, whatnot, and all that. The next game, session nine. I should say I didn't end session eight with a good hook. It was just like the middle of the conversation, time's been going on. I failed to manage correctly and design this conversation. So we just ended. Session nine, since we've been in Thunder Tree, it's been in person and the games have been exponentially better in person. Who would have thunk? My ranger <laughs> who's been gone since session two is finally back. My fighter is off doing some stuff personally so that she can't make it. But she's also told me if there's a dragon, I wanna be there for the fight. It's like, okay. In the middle of the night, they learn the dragon's coming. They go outside, it's filled with mist. The rogue tries to sneak around. This rogue hears cultists talking, follows the cultists, sees Glassstaff talking to the cultists. And who's one of these cultists? My ranger. My ranger's been here for three months. So we can get a, an idea of how much time has passed in that jump leaving the, the cave into the woods. They rest for the night with some new information. They try to explore the ruined town of Thunder Tree. They find some skeletons, some shinies. The ranger shows up to help them and tells them that the cult is horrible. It's a bad idea. The dragon arrives and flies into the wizard's tower on the top of the hill. They do some sleuthing, find more shinies, more magical items. A lot of my players are apprehensive of fighting this dragon because they don't feel confident they can survive it. I overpower them by giving them magical weapons and they feel a little bit more confident. Uh, they avoid animated armor, some more skeletons, really a lot of skill challenges versus a lot of combat. Uh, the dragon catches wind that someone's m sneaking around and messing up the town. They sneak on back to the, the druid's house. The dragon follows their scent, the warlock, makes an image and a sound happen somewhere else, tricks the dragon to go over there. The dragon is 
scent that it's been tricked follows the scent even harder to the druid house. But because of the tiny hut spell variant kind of shaped in the house, the dragon can't confirm that they're there, just smell that they've been around here. So the dragon lands on the roof right above them. Then we move on to the next session. Dragon leaves, heads back to the tower. There's a short rest. Everyone plans what to do. They decide to go to the cultist house. They go to the cultist house. They have conversations. They meet these cultists. They learn that they're normal people. Some are cursed, some have bad history. Some are just a little loony and cracked. The rogue goes around the house to go into a window and learn that the back room that belongs to the cultist the dragon cultist's leader, which is a green dragonborn. There's no furniture except for a desk with some letters. There's two, reads two letters, but got gets four of them. First two, which is an interesting thing. I had him roll D10 on my secrets and clues list. Thank you, lazy dungeon master. I knew what I was going to give him, but I wanted him to give a sense of rolling. He thought he was just rolling on random information. So he's like, this is not important, puts it away. I, one of the letters was that the goblin army is growing at the castle. When the prisoner gets brought here in the evening, the prisoner that they've been looking for since session two, there's going to be a goblin army. So I'm gonna, in the next like session or two, I'm going to remind them to look at the letters because two of them they have not read, which means I can put very valuable information right there. Uh, well, the green dragonborn shows up. They're talking, they're talking. The thief sneaks out. They discover the possibility that the dragon could be the dragon born. Green dragon, green dragon born, never in the same place at the same time. The druid looks outside and sees that with evidence that I've given them before that the dragon is actually not in the tower, wizard's tower. It's a good idea that one of my players said, and I was like, that's the truth. And then they decide to fight the dragon. They have a surprise round and they deal enough damage to kill the dragon born which triggers the phase to transform into the dragon. I pause the surprise around there because one of my players is still not back and she really wants to fight this dragon. Cool. Next session, the dragon fight begins. All my players are at the table for the first time in forever. They all fight the dragon. Finish the surprise round, then a whole nother round. The dragon's at the end of the initiative. So it goes two full rounds until the dragon gets to do anything. Holy crap, what a move. They beat down the dragon to a point that the dragon escapes through the roof, flies up. Everyone tries to run out of the farmhouse. The choice was to either go back to the druid house or to the wizard's tower that the dragon keeps going to. They decide to go to the wizard's tower, thinking that there might be another way to help kill the dragon. Possibly, maybe, who knows? They start going over there, the dragon tracks them, follows them, and lands right in front of them. My idea was to have the dragon stab its claws into the ground, turn into vines and weeds, and its head slowly becomes vines and weeds into the ground too, as thickets around them grow, push them and pull them all around, and they get separated. And that was the end. The next session, the latest session, we start at the maze. I put down a maze map and which I drew, it's like, two by six pieces of paper. The idea being they, the meta game knowledge that they can see each other is allowed as their insightful intuition. But when you make a move, you have to roll on a D6 and on a few of the numbers, you go the wrong way. If you go the wrong way, it's your character disagrees with you as a player and wants to go a different direction. Other sides of the D6 is you bump into some of the minions some of the mon uh, like skeletons, some of the cultists that survived the earlier fight. They wiped the floor with them super quick. I didn't really have their HP super high because I had a freaking dragon jumping and hiding and swinging its tail in the thicket maze itself. So it's more to feel dangerous than actually be dangerous. I think that went successful. They get through the maze, they get to the end, they head to the tower and they don't know how to get to the other side of this thicket wall. Drew it turns into a badger. <sighs> They dig underneath, escape the maze, they enter the cottage. Inside the cottage, it's old, there's a window, there's some dusty furniture, that's it. They walk through the next door. The room is filled with treasure. It is insanely full of treasure. Uh, hundreds of golds, hundreds to thousands of coppers. <laughs> you know, like insane. This is a young green dragon. And I wanna give him a little bit of a dragon hoard. They go up the stairs. It's a spiral four-story wizard tower. In the module, it's a single floor, that's it. 
and the, the whole reason I made multiple stories is one, it's at a wizard tower. Two, my druid asked, how tall is the wizard tower? Like how many stories are there? And I, we've just kind of BS it right there and kind of made that canon. And I've been rolling with that. Second floor, there are 12 skeletons. No one rolled a perception check. There are 12 skeletons and a stained glass window. They sneak by the skeletons. They get up to the third floor. They almost didn't successfully <laughs> get by the skeletons. The badger bumped, the druid's still a badger. The badger bumped into some skeletons and they had to hurry up the, 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 the sneaking. They get to the, the third floor. There's a single chest, dark black metal with silver lining. The rogue goes up, unlocks it. DC 15, got it. Another side, another lock oh, appears. He unlocks it. DC 20, he gets it with a 21. Great. Third lock opens up on the other side. DC 25, he doesn't get it after two tries. They decide to keep going. On this floor, there's another stained window. And the ranger looks out that window and sees the maze like coming in like a whirlwind and the dragon sprouting out of the top. Next door, each door up. Hatchet, door, trap door, whatever it is. Same thing, it's a vertical upway, right? It's all locked, DC 15, that's pretty tough. Uh, only a really good thief could get through this stuff. They get to the fourth floor. It's filled with dirts, grass, rubble. Half the ceiling is destroyed. And the other side of the room is a nest with three dragon eggs. This becomes some dialogue about the eggs. The ranger wants to use it against the dragon. The dragon arrives, finding them, discussing and touching her eggs. And it becomes a fight. Uh, there was a standoff, but you know, quickly, I'm just jumping it. They got a fight. They big fight with the dragon. I didn't get to do a breath weapon. And this is where I learned a lot about playing solo monsters. Okay, so one, the story is in the mechanics not in the choices for, as the DM playing the monster, right? I sh should not be trying to stand around and waste my actions and movement, moving the eggs around and protecting the eggs. Uh, it's not worth the economy. I did throw off my players by using the dodge action. <laughs> They're like, what, huh? It's, it was so funny because it's just a normal action anyone can take and just give people disadvantage. I thought it was so funny. <laughs> anyway, I should have put more emphasis effort into better like villain actions as Matt Colville uses. So round one villain action is gonna be this, round two villain action is gonna be this, round three villain action is gonna be that. The storytelling is built then into the mechanics, the rounds, and doesn't take away from my ability to co keep combat moving. I made some bad choices on who I was going to attack, but I thought I tried to stick with what made sense to the dragon at the time. And then my cleric killed the dragon with her spiritual weapon. So they, get, they kill the green dragon, they got three eggs. Uh, two green, one gray. And there's a stained glass window in this floor. The rogue decides to quickly go back to the third floor, to that chest. He rolled a 26 on that third lock. The chest opens and I end the session there. So, what did I learn? One, DMing over Zoom is incredibly difficult, incredibly hard. Playing it over the internet is hard. It is so much easier to communicate to people in person, whether, whether you can see them, can't see them, can hear them, can't hear them. Being in person is something that we as a species are just, it's just so much better and so much easier. And I was able to get better feedback faster in person, whereas like the whole, Everyone, I feel like a lot of people have talked about this, you know, the delay, the sound delay, or the, wait, who's, who said what, you said what? We can talk over each other. We can just absorb information a little bit faster. It's so much better. And I think the, the last few sessions, being in, all the sessions in Thunder Tree have done the most amount of effort towards me as a dungeon master. Over Zoom, a lot of mechanical energy has been spent trying to come up with new systems to organize this organize that which is helpful it, it solves minor problems that i have that like my rest i'm not even going to bore you with how bad i did rest in session eight playing at the table on the other hand allowed me to feel 
how to work with another person as a DM, work with my player, come up with stuff on the spot better. That is just as valuable as mastering or remastering, remaking mechanics. I definitely want to get more tough about rules. I'm a little too flex. I was a little too nice. It was mentioned a couple times in the dragon fight that I was being nice. Note, I buffed that dragon too. And from there, I've upgraded my dragon one page. I have a dragon one page that covers all my dragons, all dragons, all the time as a default standard, all that good stuff. And I reworked it based off this dragon fight. It's hard to articulate the things I learned and experienced. I definitely want to be stricter. I want to try out another puzzle, which this with I went even further to expand the tower in Thunder Tree and gave it a history uh, with a specific wizard, having the whole tower be a mystery to unlock a secret, which continues the mystery to unlock another secret that reveals something underneath the town. The thing is, they have until sunset, and that's when class staff will show with the person that they've been looking for since the beginning of the campaign. They have spent a lot, if not all their spell slots. My thought is, obviously I'm talking about a dungeon underneath the town. The dungeon itself has to have a story and it needs to have a purpose beyond spending their resources. My thought is because when they killed Glassstaff, they took her giant like 25,000 gold worth diamond. I'm going to use that somehow. My thought is maybe use it for a long rest within four hours. Um, and that's in the wizard's final private study. Uh, so I'm playing around with my map making to make uh, new ways to do secret doors, uh, secret tunnels, clues, and I'm really pushing. I have a mystery for you guys to solve if you guys want to go down this road. And one of my players, my rogue, is a mystery novel writer. <laughs> so I am I know he's going to be down for it. But my goal is to shorthand wise connect to other fantasy tropes and stories that I know all my other players are familiar with, like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and sneak in clues that are related to the wizards in those stories. For example, the stained glass windows, a blue, a green, a yellow, nothing, and a red. Uh, here, let me grab something. After they get to the basement, the first room, this is super spoilers. So I hope none of my players are watching this. This is the first room into the dungeon that I drew. So we got stairs that go down. Uh, this is, I know it's only three squares, but it's going to be about 20 or 30 feet. We got rubble and we have two pillars. There, the only way to continue is to find the secret doors. I came up with something clever. Rather than making more of these with everything being revealed, I had I looked at my sticky notes and I realized, oh, look at that, a pit trap. They figure out how to open this door. Look at that, the tunnel reveals itself. Find a secret door that goes this way. I don't have mini terrain. I feel like it's a lot, I don't have a lot of space. I found these papers and I, and I grew up light, loving to draw and you know, I, I can draw. Uh, I feel like the next session is going to be them. They're going to do one of, it's going, they're going to want to start with what's in the chest. I'm not going to give them that. I'm going to say, what is everyone else doing instead? And then I'm going to do something with the rogue and the rogue is going to get a clue that matches the stained glass windows. Hopefully the idea of a mystery to be solved has been granted. Otherwise they're going to go outside of the tower, head to Redith. There's no one else to go to. And I will have a, an attack, I'll have a battle encounter ready. And they'll probably want to rest with Redith. So either route, they will rest and regain resources. And uh, yeah, that's it, that's, that's it. You've been caught up to both the game and I was able to kind of express a little bit of my prep and my, and so you got some insight into what's going on to more. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this catch up. Please hit that like button. Leave a comment down below. Tell me what you think about these kind of videos. Tell me what 
could have done better as a DM. You can also head over to patreon.com slash fablesd20 to support the channel. You can hit the join button to support the channel. I've been talking a lot. I'm just going to go. Thank you so, so much for watching. Have a wonderful day. Say hi to your neighbor. And don't forget to use your Thaco. All right, bye.